Um, shout out to Sage, COB, Sir Major, I see you, player. Um, Afro Elite, I see you. Shout out to all the people in the room. Um, let me wait till we get around three, four hundred before we really, really get deep into the topic of what we're going to talk about. Um, but as we know, right now, the reparations movement is very heavy. We're talking reparations very heavy out here in California, where I'm from. They put out the reparations pamphlet, which was like a, a 500 page um, document really outlining, outlining the reason for reparations. Very well documented, very well documented um, um, paper, a lot of good stuff in it. Now, what I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on the compensation part. That's going to come out in a couple of weeks. The compensatory part is going to come out in a couple of weeks. That's what I have my eye on. All right. And let's be very clear. Remember, family, when it comes to compensation for foundational black Americans, it has to be cash payments first. I hear a lot of people who are brought in by the Democrats and other shills who say, well, reparations shouldn't only be a check. All of that talk. Look, it should be a check first. All right. Let's get the checks going first and then we'll talk about what else can constitute reparations, but definitely a check. All right. Let's be very clear. It has to be a check and other things included. That's fine. But we're not going to do some type of compensation in spite of a check or as opposed to getting a check. No, everything that they recommend comes with a check. OK, got to get the check first. The check is first. Let's tally up how many black FBA Californians are going to get a check from the state and the federal government or whoever we need to get it from. Let's tally that up. Find out what the dollar amount is and start sending them out. I'm going to be right at my mailbox waiting. It has to be a check first. Family, don't let them start talking about education vouchers. Um, uh, business loans and all of that stuff. It's going to have to be a check first. Check first, check first, check first. Then we can get into housing or land grants, all of that stuff, but check first. None of these intangible things. Let's not let them do anything intangible, anything where they say, well, education, education is not tangible. All right. That's not going to cut it. Education is actually relative. Education is relative. What type of education are you going to get? How, is that education going to transform into a tangible resource? Education is intangible. That's why they like to push that as some form of compensation. Education ain't good enough because education is relative. And also, you can get education without going to school. Life is education. Just living and experiencing life is education. I got my greatest education on the damn streets. I don't recommend that for everybody else. I've learned more on the streets than I learned in a school. So you can get education anywhere. Life is an education process. You learn from just living life. So we're not going to go for these intangibles. It has to be something tangible. And we have to keep our foot down on that. But Going back, they're talking about, right now, a lot of people are, their, their antennas are up because of the requirements. The reparations thing is real now. And we've designated that the requirements will be the people who are eligible are foundational Black Americans, Black people who descended from slaves, Black people who descended from freemen, Black people who can trace their lineage back before the 1900s. Great criteria. All right. That has a lot of people shook because now it's getting real. That right there was very important to designate who gets it. That was a very important step family. I want the family to know 
how important that step was. Shout out to my sister Lioness. I see you, sister. I want the family to understand how important that step was. That was important because the dominant society and their flunkies, they've already had a plan to try to get us to include everybody. They, they thought that we were going to do the kumbaya and they knew we can get these Negroes on reparations. Let's just have them do this whole thing where everybody's eligible and then we'll just cash everybody else out instead of them and we'll still be in the same position. That was their plan. They thought we were going to kumbaya this thing and they thought that they were going to use um, tethers to help do it and we didn't go for that. They kept trying to shame us into saying, hey, if you all black people get mistreated, all black people got to deal with racism. If you leave black folks out who are non-FBA, that's divisive. You don't want to be divisive. That's like white folk. They start talking all that dumbass talk. We that that didn't bother us. We didn't bend. We're not trying to get reparations for racism. We're getting reparations for slavery that was done to a specific group. Don't ever let people change that topic. They'll try to conflate slavery with just general racism that everybody goes through. And we are not going for that. We're talking about compensation for a very specific deed that was done to a very specific group, which were foundational Black Americans. Nobody else were treated and they were put in the same circumstantial um, predicament that we were put in. We were put in a unique situation and we as a unique group will be compensated in a unique way and everybody else is not included. They have been so used to us not being on that. This is sending shockwaves to people. People don't know how to react. So now that this thing is real, and we, we've been stomping hard out here in California, and everybody knows when something gets started in California, this is usually the template of what's going to happen around the nation. So all eyes are on us out here in California right now. Us on the grassroots, us keeping our eye on those reparations committees and commissions out here, and us speaking on those things, you better believe that made an impact. So now people are watching very heavy. They put out that page, that, that, that booklet the other day talking about the requirements and why it's important and the wave and the movement is getting even stronger. But now we have to watch out for these groups who are trying to undermine reparations, <clears throat> the Encobras and all these other people who are sent by the, the Democrats and other groups. These groups are popping up, and I put this up on my um, Twitter the other day. Some group called NBCI Trust, the National Black Cultural Information Trust. Who the hell are these people? I want y'all to watch out for names like that. Watch out for these groups that pop up out of nowhere, family. Because, see, the, the good thing about the grassroots, we all kind of correspond with each other, so we kind of know who's who on the grassroots. We all kind of socialize online. We, we know who's who. We know who the real ones are. We know who the riders are. We, we're kind of familiar with each other. But watch when y'all see these weird names, these groups pop up out of nowhere. You know, nobody never heard of them. And they got lawyers and all these people writing these dissertations and writing their opinions about reparations. Understand these are people that were papered up by the dominant society and put out here to try to look like grassroots. But I put up a press release. Somebody actually emailed me this. They were sending out email blasts to certain people. And somebody sent me an email blast by this NBCI trust group. And I want to read that to you for those who haven't read it. It says the National Black Cultural Information Trust um, they, we celebrate California Reparations Task Force and Interim Report, but hope for changes to eligibility requirements. <clears throat> okay, here they go. In fact, let me let me do this, guys. Let me retweet. Let me put it on the jumbotron. Let me do that. Let me do that, family. Let me put it on the jumbotron while I go over it. 
because this is very important, family. And I want y'all to see this stuff. Okay, let me... Okay, how do I put this on the Jumbotron? Um, how do I put this on the damn Jumbotron? What do I do? Okay. How the hell do I put this on here? I'm, I'm like the old nigga in the room. Hold on. Okay, do I put it up like that? Okay, I think it's up here already. God, do y'all see it? Okay, there it is. All right, there you go. Okay, <clears throat> I figured it out. Good. Okay, so that's the report up there. <clears throat> you guys can click on it and read over it with me. So they're talking about they hope for changes to eligibility requirements. It said the California Reparations Task Force, they're making a decisive step forward on the road to reparations. The report is an extensive, is extensive and it details the horrors that descendants of Africans in the United States have endured. Watch out for that bullshit, man. Watch out for that. They they keep trying to Africanize us as a way to undermine us. That's not to embrace some big pan-Africanism. That's they keep they keep trying to Africanize us so that they can tether other people on here. Watch how they word this stuff. Descendants of Africans in the United States. Uh Uh-uh, I ain't been a descendant of Africans in a long time. I'm a foundational black American. Everybody is a descendant of an African, all right? Life started in Africa. We're not playing that game. Everybody on the planet is a descendant of Africa. We are foundational black Americans. Let me go on and read the rest. I just got to hip y'all to the weasel words here. However, we hope that the California Reparations Task Force strongly reconsiders their current limitation of eligibility determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. See? So they're pissed and they're still trying to find a way to undermine us by letting all black folks be eligible for reparations. And that makes no sense. That makes no sense whatsoever. All black people cannot be eligible because if you let all black people eligible, that's going to open the door for all of these other groups, too. And they know that. Let me read the rest of it. It says reparations, experts, historians, organizations, including the National African-American Reparations Commission, that's NARC, and the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and COBRA, and anti-racism educators stress that while tracing direct enslaved ancestry is possible for some African Americans, it's not feasible for all harmed families or communities. <sighs> Additionally, extensive ancestry tracing, ancestry tracing measures can be time consuming, it can be expensive, it can be traumatic, and it can create additional barriers to access. Stop. So now they're saying if we start looking up our lineage, that's just going to be too traumatic. It's just so hard to look up your background. This is horse crap. We know who we are. We know how to trace our lineage back. This is garbage. How many of you can easily trace your lineage back to the damn 1800s. I can trace mine to the 1700s, family. Raise your hand, family, if you can trace your lineage back, my FBA family. It is not that hard. They're sitting up here making making this seem like it's some type of monumental task to do. We know how to trace our lineage back. Look at my sister in here. Y'all wait for my sister Tia. That's my sister in here. I got my lineage up in here right now. Um, it is not that hard to trace your lineage back. You can go on Ancestry. Hell, you can go ask your grandma. God damn it. You can, your grandma, you know how your mama be having all the, these documents all over the place? Your mama probably got all the Ancestry information in a mattress somewhere in the house. You know, your mama keep every damn thing. We know where we come from and who we are and how to trace our family members back. It's not that hard to do. They're running game. They're trying to act like this is such a hard task. This is this is all cap. Let me read the rest of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thus, direct enslaved ancestry tracing should not be the determinant factor for eligibility. Reparations expert, activist, lawyer, Adoja 
Ayetoro outlines legal and ethical issues with lineage-based eligibility requirements. For large-scale reparative justice initiatives among local governments and states and national levels, elim eliminating barriers to access for essential is essential for reaching and repairing black communities. And they say an alternative to lineage-based reparations is harms-based reparations, which recognizes that black communities have endured centuries of dehumanizing delays and barriers to reparative justice. No, that right there is a trick bag. No. Now family, they know good and well if we start saying, hey, don't put it on lineage, let's just make it for people who've been harmed by racism. Hell no. Do y'all know that just kills everything dead on its tracks? That will kill it immediately. The reparations will be useless because everybody and their mama can make a claim then. You hell no, you don't make it harm based. Everybody who was harmed by racism. Okay, that's every black person. That's every Hispanic. There's white people who can claim they were harmed by racism. Hell no. Arabs, everybody and their mama will be eligible for reparations, and they know this. The name of the game is to get us to co-sign one of these janky-ass tether initiatives so that we can be undermined, so that this tether group can get them a little endowment from the government. These little groups who pop up, remember, like I said, these groups that nobody ever heard of, a lot of them are these nonprofit groups with these old, dusty, decrepit Negroes in them, and they get little kickbacks from these liberal think tanks, man. They're trying to undermine us for their own financial benefit, family. That's all this is. In Cobra, these people get chipped off by the Democratic brass. I met somebody from in Cobra years ago. Somebody came to a lecture I did in Boston. I did a lecture in Boston and some some old lady from in Cobra came up and brought me a bunch of in Cobra documents. This was, uh, what, what year was this? Oh, what year? I, I can't remember. It was some years back. I forgot how long ago it was, but she brought me some in Cobra documents. And I read through that and it was like, well, the first thing I noticed, well, we don't want a check. A check would be insulting. We need education and we need Pan-Africanism. We need to go back to the motherland. I said, if y'all don't get this, I use that as I put that in the dog cage to let the dogs crap and pee on it. That's all it was good for. Dog piss. When I read that, I said, in Cobra's full of it. When the minute they start talking about we don't need no money, run for the hills. These are enemies among us. We ain't playing that game. These people who are pushing that pan-Africanism line and also these people who are not even FBA. Did y'all see what's the um, spokesperson for Biden? Uh, what's it, Kareem Jean-Pierre? Did y'all see somebody asked her about the reparations in California? Now, the other day when they had the, the Asian groups up there talking about Asian hate, her ass was up there skinning and grinning. Boy, she was all teeth when the Asians were up there talking about anti-Asian hate crimes while they were ignoring black people getting gunned down by these race soldiers, Jean Bierre, she was up there skinning and grinning. And when they asked her the other day about reparations, boy, when they, they asked her about reparations, that woman's eyes got to bucking something fierce. Boy, they asked her that the, her eyes were literally bucking and she looked offended. She was like, well, they say, well, how come Biden ain't, ain't saying nothing about reparations in California? Oh, Biden, his position is the same. His position is the same. Well, she got real cold. Yeah, his, his position on reparations is the same. Next question. It was that type of vibe. Well, we got to watch these tethers, family. We got to watch these tethers. These tethers are really trying to undermine the game here. These tethers are really trying to undermine what we got going on out here. We're not playing that game. Like I was talking about the other day, that tether, that dude who shot up that doctor out there in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, that um, Michael Lewis guy, the white media, they knew that that guy 
was non-FBA. And let me tell you something. This is why it's very important that we stay on top of the game. I was the first person. I told y'all that that wasn't no, that's a goddamn tether. That dude is Haitian. I was the first person to tell people that. Now, there's articles now. They're confirming that, too. There's other articles now. So now they're admitting it. Now that we've already put it out there, that the guy who starts shooting up those people out there in Tulsa, he, him and his brother immigrated from Haiti some years ago. But I, I found the guy's yearbook picture. His name is no damn Michael. His name is Michelet Luis Baptiste. And his mother, he's Haitian as hell. And that's what the white media like to do. They'll... They'll hide the background of some of these people who do these crimes so they can push this on, so they can make it seem like, oh, this is just black on black crime. Oh, look at what y'all doing to each other. I, I keep telling people a lot of these crimes that happen to black folks, especially to FBA, a lot of these are non-FBA people doing these crimes. A lot of these people are tethers doing these crimes against FBA, man. And even in Tulsa, the that type of crime, the fact that he targeted that black doctor, I knew he was a tether. We don't, let me tell y'all some, some street shit. There's an unwritten rule with, with, with street cats, who foundational black American street cats, I put it that way. There's an unwritten rule. You don't target professional black people. You don't target black people who are coll in college and you don't target professional black people. That's kind of been an unwritten rule for a long time. Hustlers and street cats, people who get paper out here in the, on, the, on the block, you just don't do anything to harm a professional black person. Meaning you don't, you don't mess with black people who are doctors. You don't shoot them. You don't, you don't shoot lawyers. You don't shoot college cats. So whenever you see a black person who's a doctor or something get killed by another black person, nine times out of 10, the, that other black person is a damn tether. I knew that that type of crime, him targeting a black person, especially a black doctor, that's a tether. We don't do that. That's something we don't do. If you understand FBA culture and, and the street culture, you'll understand that. I remember down in Atlanta a few years ago, some, some dusty dude killed this college girl. He killed this college girl. And I said, that, that's a tether. That's a tether that we, we don't do that. And sure enough, it was some Trinidadian dude. We can tell just by the types of crimes. We, we know who deuced it. Hustlers and street dudes and cats who, who, who get busy on the block. The college kids are hands off. That's always been a thing. You don't mess with no college kid who's a black kid. You don't mess with college kids. In fact, you go out of your way to try to protect them because you don't want them out there on the block. If you see them get an education, you want them to keep at it so they can become a doctor, lawyer, so they can help us get off the damn block eventually. Yeah, we want you to get out there and get that education. If you become a lawyer, I need you to help me. If you become a doctor and something happened to me, I need you to help me. If you become a cop or a judge, you need to help me. That's the mentality of a lot of street dudes. So we don't really mess with College folks are professional black people. They've always been hands off when it comes to street business. But tethers come in and just start mowing everybody. You understand? They, they start targeting women, kids, professionals, the whole shebang. We got to know who's doing this stuff among us. And another interesting thing. Remember, we're talking about reparations for a long time and, and the tethers were telling us to shut up. Remember? Remember um, Cynthia Revo's homegirl, Lovey? These are Nigerians. She did a whole paper. She, she admitted she was in high school and she did a paper talking about how we shouldn't be getting no damn reparations. They were big on us telling us we shouldn't get no reparations and you niggas are not going to get it. Stop begging the government. Stop begging the white man and pull, a, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, nigga. Remember they're telling us that? Now that this thing got legs, now that it's moving, now that we stayed on our grind like FBAs do, we stayed on our damn FBA grind. We don't give up. We keep on keeping on. We keep on pushing. Now that this thing got legs and we're pushing it out here and now we're getting things passed, now we got a lot of momentum. Now we ain't backing down and the grassroots movement for it is getting stronger now the same tethers who was sitting up here trying to denigrate us about getting reparations, they want to get latched on to it now. What about me, nigga? Hey, hey, FBA. Hey, what, what, what? This is divisive. What about me? I deal with racism too, niggas. 
Now, now everybody wants to get on now. Now y'all want to cop, please. Now it's divisive. Y'all were the ones telling us we need to shut up and whoop de whoop. Now, now it's what about me, nigga? You, you see? You see how that energy goes? But we're going to get some reparations. Let's be clear. I, I told people years ago, we're going to get reparations. I've been saying that. I've been talking about reparations publicly since 2013. If y'all check the record, I mean, we're going to get reparations. That's going to happen. We, we've we just never been as focused as we are now. All we have to do as foundational black Americans, man, we stay focused. We can get anything done. That's why they keep trying to get our focus off. This is why they always try to push other people around us so that we can be non-focused. Now, why don't y'all get with some interracial dating? No, no, no. Let's be on some kumbaya. Let's pray to the Lord and forgive. Remember the, the, the white supremacists were on here a few weeks ago talking about, well, we don't need to get reparations because Jesus, Jesus forgave all the white folks. I didn't get the memo from Jesus. <laughs> no. Now, Jesus told y'all something other than what he told me. Jesus told me to get, get that paper. Jesus told me, get the paper and don't trust y'all ass. That's what Jesus told me. Jesus said, hey, they nailed me to the cross. Don't trust their ass. Get that money. That's what Jesus told me. Now, let me get some of the family on here because we got a lot of folks on here tonight. We are deep in here, almost a thousand people in here tonight. Let's let's raise your hand and let's chime it up, chop it up with the family. I see Sonny, Brother Sonny. I see A. Lewis, some of the regulars. I see T.S., Giselle in there. I see you. I see um, Afro Elite. I see the family in here. Let's get... um. Let's get Sage. Let's get Sage in here. What's up, Sage? Brother Flex, how's everything, brother? Flex, I'm, brother. I'm, I'm good, brother. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I wanted to, um, something that you said was very interesting. You pointed out reparations. Uh, today, New York passed an A9437 Act, which, um, is specific about reparations, but it muddies the waters. It specifically says something about, I'm not going to read it, but it says about the hardships that African Americans um, endured throughout, you know, from from chattel slavery and that they their descendants endured today. But it doesn't say anything specifically about lineage. So, what? Right. What? Yeah, y'all y'all need to get on them Absolutely. about that. Now, in, yeah, in New York, get on them about that. Get on them about that language. That language is very, very important. Um, just like with this out here. Remember, out here, when they were getting the reparations documents together, they were using a lot of this real weird language, and I was on their bumper. I was having private, private conversations with some of these folks who's on that commission. Um, even before they started having these public commissions, I was having private conversations with them, letting them know, y'all better get that language right. Look, we'll get the grassroots completely against this bill if this language ain't right. Y'all got to have grassroots support on this. If the language is janky, we're shooting this thing down. Get this language right. Let's stop all of that African this and African that. We're talking about a specific group. Make it very specific to uh, people who descended from slaves, foundational black Americans, foundational freedmen, whoever. People who are freedmen. Us. Us, us, us. It has to be very specific. And they finally got it right. But we stayed on their bumper about it. In New York, don't let these folks put that little trick bag language in there and try to get people to support it. Because, see, they got to get the grassroots. To, they got to get the grassroots to support it. The dominant society is not going to support it on their own. The dominant society will support it when the grassroots in large numbers are supporting it. OK, which they are. There's not as much pushback. As people think, because people see people, let's be clear, the dominant society knows we deserve reparations. They know that. But the name of the game is to talk dumb and to, to kind of shout you down and all of that. When you when you're not afraid of that, then they get some act right. All right. For years, what they've done when the minute we talk about reparations, they start shouting you down and just kind of scaring niggas. We ain't scared no more. All right. We ain't scared about the shouting down. And if they want to have an intellectual conversation, we can have that, which they don't. Because what happens is their arguments are so childish and goofy, it gets into trolling, which makes them look worse. So they know that we deserve reparations. We just have to stop being scared to bring it to them and let them know this is what it is. We have to learn how to exert power. And that's what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen. Let me get my brother Afro Elite on here. 
real quickly. Let's get Afro Elite on here to chime in. All right, Afro Elite, chime in, brother. Can you hear me? I can hear you, brother. The phone is a little janky, but what's on your mind, bro? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to be brief then. I just want to say uh, it's very important that we are very precise, in particular with the verbiage, because if we know our history and we know what happened with affirmative action, originally that was a plan that was made specifically for foundational Black Americans. That was the original design and purpose for it. But then they changed the word from black. They changed it to minority. And then next thing you know, all of these other groups classified as minority because minority is such a vague term anybody can classify. So now today, white women are the number one beneficiaries of affirmative action. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with reparations if we allow any bit of wiggle room at all. So that's why when right. it comes to reparations, we have to stay very firm and uncompromising on the language, and we have to make sure it's strictly and exclusively for foundational Black Americans. Yes, sir, man. Real talk. They slipped that minority thing, in, and they did it at the last minute. When they were passing that civil rights bill and all that and affirmative action, they slipped in the word minority literally at the last minute. And 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 then they defined what a minority was. They redefined what a minority was. They said, first, the minority was a, a, a non-white person. And then at the last minute, they said, also, yeah, women, because the, the white feminist movement, they were trying to get that popping. So they said, well, white women, women are a minority too, because they're a grief group. So now we let that happen. We're like, okay, white women can get it too. I mean, we all oppressed. We all in this together now. And they were doing the Birdman hand rub. They were like, we got these niggas. And they got us. They whooped our ass with that minority word. They got us on that minority word. They pulled a whammy bammy, and they've been pulling that whammy bammy for the last 60 years, and we got to stop going for it. We have to put that minority word in the grave. The minute somebody comes around you using the word minority, you have to look at that as a damn epithet. You have to look at that person as hostile. I don't let nobody use the word minority around me. They get it. They get checked real quick, especially if you're in the dominant society. Hey, we're, we're doing something for minorities. I don't know what that is. I'm not a minority, dude. I'm a foundational black American. What are you doing for me and my group? Don't tell me what you're doing for no damn minority. Don't let them latch us on with other groups, just like with these shootings. All these black folks got slaughtered up there in Buffalo. One Asian person got shot in a church out here by another Asian person. They redefined that as a hate crime, which it wasn't a hate crime, but they redefined it, conflated it with all those black people getting killed, and then say, hey, we got to do something about all of these hate crimes against black and Asian. We know what to do. Let's bring an Asian group to the White House and talk about anti-Asian crime bills. And we sit up here and let these folks run these trick bag ass games on us. Y'all got to be loud to shout that nonsense down and let them know, you guys, your name is mud out here on these streets. The the Biden administration, their name is mud out here, and it should continue to be. And the only people who's pushing for Biden and the Democrats right now are these old, decrepit, geriatric niggas. Did y'all see? I've seen some some footage up there. Shout out to our brother Marcel. He was um, showed up to Clyburn's little speech somewhere, and it was... It was like, it was like a damn Frankie Beverly concert in there. It was just old black folks and shout out to Frankie Beverly, no disrespect, but it was a lot of old, old black folks up in there. Their constituency is, is really old black folks who then gave up. They, they, they look all defeated. They were just sitting around looking like, when do the catfish nuggets come out? That's, that's their voter base right there. They're struggling. They know good and well they're in trouble. Young black folks are not rocking with that program. We're asking for tangibles. You got to come correct with some damn tangibles. Let me get some more people in here. All right, we got a lot of folks up in here tonight. Let's get Immortal Melanin. Immortal Melanin, then we'll get, um, who else? Hop on Immortal Melanin. 
right. Y'all come on through. Yes, now. sir. How you doing, brother? Doing great, fam. All right, what's on your mind, sir? Just want to come uh, tell the people to go ahead and uh, get with your um, thing that you got going for uh, getting your movie, the next movie going. You got a thing. Uh, the Kickstarter, yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah, the Kickstarter. But before I forget, yeah, the Kickstarter, yes. We still got the Kickstarter for the movie American Maroon. We need the family to get involved with that when the link is in my profile. Y'all click on my picture and um, hit that Kickstarter link. I definitely need the family to help get involved with that so we can make that happen. Let's get Ashy Foot in here. Hey, Brother Flex. What's up, Ashy Foot? Yes. Put the next or put the foot on their necks. These yes. pedas, they are going to lie on you. But I'm telling you, I'm from there. I'm there in the motherland. I'll tell you this way. They look for a way to hustle their way to get that money. But the thing is this. Flex. Verbiage has to be right. Has to be your people. And I'm behind you. I leave you that. My man, I appreciate you. Listen, when I get my reparations, I'm going to get you some lotion for the ashy feet. Of course, feet. of course, I need that. I your need feet, that. Your, oh, your yeah, feet. It's ashy, of course. It's... Yes, them feet are going to look like new when I'm done with you, Umbutu. Uh, let's get Kimmy in here. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say that I think we have a lot of momentum right now. Yeah. You know, the Democrats, they took advantage of the Black Lives Matter the George Floyd situation just to yeah. get power. Yeah. And now they've woken people up. And now people are awake and they want reparations and they're they're trapped into a corner that they can't get out of. Yeah. Yes. So now is the time where we need to take this moment and we need to ride the wave and we need to take ownership of the movement. Yes. We can't yeah. let too much cream get into the coffee. You know, this is our thing and we need to fight for it. That's all I want to say. Man, I appreciate you, brother. Real talk. Yeah, man. We're not going for no trick bags. We're not going for no trick bags right now, man. We are focused, and that's the thing. They do not want us to be focused. We should have been focused like this a long time ago, family. We should have been focused like this a long time ago. All right, let's get um, let's get Feck Miller. All right. What's up, Feck Miller? What's up, Tariq, man? Blessing to you. Hey, man, you changed my life. Hey, as far as that, uh, I'm going to change a little bit. As far as the uh, the uh, immigrants that come over here, like you said, <laughs> when, uh, for instance, when they win that race, for instance, the Jamaican girls won that uh, Olympic, everybody start throwing that flag around. But you got people like yeah. Shadi, who's with 6 9 shooting all kind of crap up in New York. And when he get locked up, they don't. He don't run around with that Jamaican nothing. They consider him a, a yeah. black American who's doing all his shooting right. in New York. All them guys that was in that damn Treyway gang was damn foreign motherfuckers. But, all of uh, them, exactly. All yeah, and, yeah, and you hit it right on the head, man. I, I just want to say blessings to you, brother. Love you. Much respect, man. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. Right now, whenever these folks are doing crimes, they're gonna keep that same energy. Don't start sitting up here waving your flag. When you get a, a a gold medal or when you get a PhD, wave that flag when you shoot somebody too. What's up, um, Clout? What's your name, brother? Uh, Clout, uh, bro. Clout, bro. What's up? What's, What's up, Clout? You've been on here before, right? I've not been on a Tarish base before. I've not. I've always been meaning okay. to. I'm a big fan of what you do. There you go. Now, Clovis, where are you from? Me? I'm from Chicago. I'm from uh, I'm from like Lakeview. I'm not really like uh, I'm I'm pretty like white and preppy i'm like a lamo but uh now where's your family from where did, oh where my did family from? from oh my family's yeah. uh my family my family's like dutch we came into new amsterdam like 1660 oh okay okay so y'all were part of that salem witch trial thing right uh well no that's a little bit north uh we were we were like in new york selling selling stuff okay we were we okay. were like we were we were new yorkers uh and then eventually we came over to chicago and we have a branch in like Virginia or something. It's all, it's all a little wacky, but uh, Very yeah. Anyway, I I was I came in to ask. So, like Tariq, I you know I've looked I've you know seen some of your spaces, watched some of what you do. 
I have I have a question for you, just kind of like in long term, long term. So like, when right. when we win, when we get the when we get the Black Nation, like, what's the uh, what's like what's like the government structure you think we should have? The what's a Black Nation? What do you mean? I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. Okay, you know what? Never mind. What is what is your you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna completely rephrase this question. What would right. be like your ideal like governmental structure? Um, the ideal governmental structure is a non-white supremacist run government so that everything is based on real justice. What we have now is not a justice system. We have a white supremacist system from top to bottom. I want a real justice system, meaning, as our brother Neely Fuller said, you guarantee that nobody is mistreated and you guarantee those who need the most constructive help will get the most constructive help. We don't have that right now. We have a white supremacist system where people classified as white get a certain level of immunity from law and immunity of punishment and certain benefits and privileges simply based on race. And black people get um, detriment and deprivation and punishments based on race. That's not the system that we should be in. So I would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, what what you're saying is, you know, reasonable. I think my question is, I, I'm kind of trying to dive in a little bit deeper here. Like, how how would a government do that? Like, so with, with the current American system, we're in like a mixed economy, uh, representative democracy. Right. Do you think you would still want like a democracy or would you want like so like different, like um, maybe a, a you know, state with like more centralized like power in order to enforce that like you know removal of white supremacy in order to you know enforce that equality and equity well here's the thing the white supremacists um it's a system that eventually eats itself it's been eating itself slowly really for the last 500 years it's the most powerful system in the world but it eats itself it's going to die off anyway and okay you, you see what I'm saying? Let me give you an example of why it's going to die off and how it eats itself. Um, any evil, corrupt system that you have to enforce militarily, it always dies off. Just like ancient Rome. When Rome got janky and raggedy and Caligula was doing all types of freaky nonsense, the Roman Empire, um, laying up with horses and fucking his cousins and just doing weird stuff. Um, they were enforcing these draconian laws militarily and the money was running out and then eventually they got taken over by the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and all of that stuff and then Rome fell and Europe went into a dark age. Well, hold um, on. Actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. Europe didn't actually go into a dark age. I would, I'm actually gonna, I'm, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue with this on you now. Oh, Just because get, I think this, oh, is a, this is a huge misconception oh, let's when get it comes it. to Europe. Oh, let's get it. Okay. All right, all right. Okay. So, if you're not totally aware by in the last couple centuries of the Roman Empire, uh, the econ the economy of the cities, the Roman system of like you know centered being centered around the like urban areas around the cities, particularly Rome, was starting to fall apart. Like it was not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um. So as time went on, you know, near especially like you know around the time of the Hun invasions, as the Goths are starting to come into Rome. Uh, millions and millions of Ro of like Roman citizens and plebe especially like plebeians and like freed slaves, they all went out to the countryside, mm -hmm. and they were high and they were called coloni, like like c o c o l o n i, and the coloni were uh, essentially serfs. Mm -hmm. They worked as like medieval serfs, so they were serfs before serfdom even existed, and then by the time of like the Roman collapse, the Roman Empire. This is like most of the Roman economy was these like, you know, biggest, huge estates that, uh, you know, went on to become the feudal kingdoms, you know, the feudal like duchies and counties and so on. Uh huh. So like the, like Europe did not fall into a dark age. It was just, okay. you even, didn't... From that, even just from the perspective of purely collapsing, it, it just uh, kind of lost that semblance of uh, like a centralization. 
essentially sure. is what happened in Europe. Europe became decentralized. Sir, decentralized. sir if you don't stop, if you don't stop, you did, sir. And I've been noticing there's some white historians that have been trying to rewrite European history to try to say the Dark Ages wasn't that bad. It was that bad. Well, it was it was that bad, but it wasn't that bad because like the empire collapsed. It co- it was like the re- like the issues with the Dark Ages were not like you know the loss of intellectual you know learning. Like there's still substantial technological advancement. They just sure. shifted what it was towards. Like there's some huge technological advancements in agriculture, and there's like massive like you know by the time you sure. know oh, it's a bit tumultuous for a while because of the uh, the when Vikings did, in the north. Did, when did they get this agricultural advancement in Europe during the Middle Ages? Uh, over time, basically from year. What year? Uh huh. Um, I think like the latest was like around the year thousand sir. but i think but there were a lot before then okay like, sir you, you know. don't, sir i don't know if you don't know your history sir okay hold on hold on hold on i know i know you're arguing sir, i know i know what you're trying to say hold on because man okay, okay. first of all they almost half of europe died off because of the damn justinian plague the justinian plague killed half of europe oh that was just the first plague Y'all were dying off up there. You almost completely died off. And the Justinian plague ended in 725. Why did it end in 725? Why that year, sir? Uh, okay, I got to admit, maybe my, maybe my knowledge of the Dark Ages is a little less than I yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Your brother, you don't want to play that with me. because I'm gonna all, all right, yeah, all right, all right. I, I actually, I actually did not know about the Justinian plague. That's yeah, different. that was the first plague, and then the other plague came later, and the Justinian. The thirteen hundreds. Oh, wait, was there's another Justinian plague? Yeah, the Black Plague, the, the the Black Plague. That was the other plague that almost. Oh yeah, okay, okay, you're talking about plague. Yeah, yeah that's but uh. People think... they like to talk about the Justinian plague, which damn near killed everybody, and it was the Moors who came in in seven eleven who brought in science and medicine. They were the ones who stopped it. That's where all the medicines came from. It came from the Black Moors. That's why the Justinian Plague ended in 725, a decade or so after the Moors came in. They introduced alcohol and elixirs and things like that to cure the people because it was so filthy up there. The people up there didn't even want to bathe because they thought bathing was evil. It was a very dark age, sir. Don't try to rewrite it. Well, it was, yeah, it was a dark age in you know, 400 to 700, like, you know, 400 to 700, 400 to 800. Uh But, like, there's a huge misconception that the Dark Ages lasted for, like, a thousand years or, like, 800 years, when it was a much smaller stretch of time. Sir, they didn't start traveling outside of Europe, the Europeans, until 1492. Sir? Well, they, well, they, what do you mean they didn't start, they didn't start traveling? There was lots of, like, trade, intercontinental trade. Between oh. Europe and Africa and Europe and Asia. Yeah, the Moors. It was the Moors doing all of that stuff. It wasn't just the Moors. It's also the Turks. Well, the, it's also the, the like the Russians. The, the Moors, Turks. There were Turkish Moors. There were black the Turks. Yeah, there were Turkish Moors. And in fact, the, the Moors, when they it were. Wasn't all, it wasn't just the Moors, though. Like the Moors were in Spain. The Moors were in like. Spain, Western and North Africa. They, they were in Italy too, and this is why Spain and Italy were the most popping places of Europe. Everybody from Europe was coming down to Spain. They were going to those Moorish universities in Cordoba and Toledo. That's where they were going. That's the only part of Europe that was popping during the Middle Ages. Spain. That's why. The whole, okay. Come on, you better know your history, sir. During the early Middle Ages, yeah, you could argue that, right. but by. But by like 1099, the University of Bologna was formed. That you know, like the you know the thousand to fourteen hundred stretch of the Middle Ages is still important. Taking information that they got from the Moors, they were going and studying in Spain under the Moors, and they would take that knowledge and that information into other. Yeah, they were studying information they got from the Moors that the Moors got from the Greeks and the Romans. And the Greeks and the Romans got it from the Africans in Egypt. So let's not even try that game either. Whoa, 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 whoa. They didn't whoa. just get it from the Africans in Egypt. Yes they, yes, they did. The Greeks studied at the feet of Africans in Egypt. Yes, they did. Herodotus, all right, all right. Well, they all studied right, all right. at the feet of Africans in Egypt. They got all of their game from Egypt, sir. All of it. All right, all right. 
All right. I, I'm not. I'm not too well read enough to like totally uh, to refute that point. So we'll. But I am, and I'm telling. I'll, I'll, con- I'll concede that point for now. Uh, there you go. There you go. So how do you? So how do you feel about reparations? By the way, how, how do, do you- I feel about reparations? Yes. I think. I think. Um, I'm not like opposed. I, you know, there's people on my. You know, a lot of people. That, you know, I guess from like the whites perspective, that are against it. I'm talking um, about you. I'm talking about you, sir. Talking about me? Personally. No, I'm just you. Personally, I, I like giving context for this thing, but yeah. Um, I think I believe in reparations for like Jim Crow and segregation. Why not slavery, which was way more harsh than just Jim Crow segregation? Hello, hello. Oh, well, shit, he bounced. What the hell? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, there he is. Oh, wait, he's back again. Okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, let me have him back on. Wait, what are you doing, brother? Okay. Okay, I don't know what's going on with his phone. Twitter. So the reason why I am not wholly convinced of the idea of reparations for slavery is because if you, and you can, I we can, you know, you can disagree with me on this, but in the Civil War, around 600,000 people died, like 600,000 soldiers. And in this transatlantic, transatlantic trade, slave trade, around 600,000 slaves were brought to the United States. Now, obviously, there were more slaves than that by the time of the Civil War. But I think um, I, have, I have heard the argument, and I kind of agree with this, that those 600,000 deaths were kind of, in a way, the reparations for the slavery. You know, we paid in are blood. You in, we paid in blood. Are, are you insane? Are you really using that argument, sir? I mean, it's obviously it's not perfect. There's like you no, know, sir. You know that's the goofiest nonsense you ever. So? You know that. That's you know how goofy that is. First of all, the Civil War. They weren't fighting to free black people. Well, no, no, they weren't Let's... fighting to free black people. That's true. Um. That's, that's not the argument I'm trying to make, though. That is, that is, it is? you're talking about. They, well, I'm not. Blood. I'm they not saying it like blood. happened because of slavery. I'm saying. Okay, well, slow down, because now you're about to start mayo explaining. Okay, you said some silly and asinine, and now you're trying to walk it back. Now you know that was silly. They paid in blood. Stop that. Come on now. Let's let's talk real. Y'all stop making okay, those. Okay. You know what? Goofy, All right. you, you know better. All right, all right. Stop. You do good and well, because you're a white man, so you know stuff. You're not dumb. You know good and well that this was not a war to in to to free black people. That was a consequential thing that happened later. No, no, no. That's I, I agree about, with you there. The whole, thing about, the whole thing about freeing black people came later, Way later because yeah. the North was losing. The North was losing the Civil War. The South was beating the brakes off the North. If you look at the early battles. The South was beating the crap out of the North because remember all of those military schools, West Point and all that, those were in the South. So the South advantage. The North started winning when they let black people fight. When black people started fighting with the Union, that's when they started winning. All right. right? And then the deal, black folks said, hey, what are we going to get out of this? And they said, hey, if y'all help (laughs) us win, we'll let freedom. Ah, there you go. So don't sit up here talking about some people shed blood for us because let's be clear. No, I didn't say okay, okay, hold on, hold on. I think there's a I think there's a misconception of what I said. I didn't say that I was I'm not trying to imply that like all the Civil War soldiers were all fighting for slavery and they knew their deaths were gonna be like paying for slavery. I think that in like a I'm saying when I say like they paid in blood, I mean like America itself, you know, unintentionally, without trying to like paid in blood for its crime of slavery by like I'm sorry I'm fucking looking at uh, my friend like spamming emojis I shouldn't be laughing about this I'm sorry uh the uh no no uh, no they no we need money. no 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 we need money because they got money from us they didn't they didn't just get blood from us they got labor and that oh, labor okay, okay. and that exploit built this whole nation so everybody can come and enjoy all of the wealth of this nation that has been compounded over and over again to the trillions and trillions that we see now. So we have to be compensated with money. All right. All right. 
and that makes sense. I, yeah, I I get I understand your argument. Um, I don't think right. I don't think your your argument's definitely based in reality. I would say. Um, right. I do I do have like because my phone's at six percent. I gotta go soon. Um, yeah, I know you. I know you do. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank no, you I'm so not done. Much. I'm not done yet. I have one last thing to ask. Uh, one last thing. One last thing. So when you just and this is just out of pure curiosity, uh, how much money do you think, um, like each black person should get for slavery reparations, and also reparations um, we, for segregation? We can start off with, and here's a very low number: at least a hundred thousand per foundational Black American family. We can start off there. That's a start off point, point. Right. and that's a very conservative number okay so we can start off there and then we can work our way up and find out whatever other compensations that are needed but a hundred thousand per family we can start there and that's a low number by the way but that's a start we can start there and that's not something that people can say oh that's just crazy no because they're giving all types of money to afghanistans and ukrainians and hispanic groups and you're giving money to asian groups so um yeah they they have the money for us so all right all um right. All right, man. But anyway, thank you so much, brother. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Sorry, sorry, I kind. Of... Okay. See, see, y'all gotta check that type of stuff when they start talking silly. This is why, family, it is important for you to know history, because that man right there, he's not naive. This is a lesson here. I want to show y'all lessons here. That man is not naive, and he's not dumb. You know, he, he it gets into kind of goofy, trollish type of stuff where they play dumb and say these little asinine things. He knows better. Just like the thing about the Dark Ages, this dude know that Europe was in a dark age. See, they try to rewrite their history because they hope we don't know. You see, they'll try to rewrite their history hoping that we don't know the truth. Unfortunately, I know the truth. I've studied your history. I know European history. I got all the times and the dates and everything. So yeah, you're not going to sit here and tell me there was no dark age when the Europeans were over there starving, broke, hungry, stinking, musty, head lice, and then uh, skin and toes falling off. Yeah, it was real bad over there. They know it. It was horrible over there. It was a complete dark age. And they know that. It was nothing popping over there for a long time until the Moors came in and got things popping for them. They hate that fact. That's why they don't never talk about the Middle Ages of Europe. You notice that in movies, they never talk about the Middle Ages. The, the years between 500 um, AD, between those years, 500 AD and 1300, they never talk about Europe. And even if they do medieval type of movies about it, they always do it in the realm of fantasy. Just like Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones has a, midi a medieval type of vibe, but there's dragons and um, magic and all this other stuff. They got to put it in the, in the realm of fantasy because the reality was too harsh. It was nothing popping up there. Nothing. It was raggedy, dusty, dirty, nothing, no culture, nothing. And they know that. And this is why you better understand history. Okay, let me get some more people on here. And then when they start talking about reparations, with that silly nonsense about they paid in blood, stop it. He knows better. This is why when we do these films, family, you got to support these films. You got to support these films. These films will get my, my documentary films will put you on all the game. It's very important that you watch these films and you teach these films to your children so they will not have the wool pulled over their eyes. Family, we got a brand new movie called American Maroon. It's jammed packed with historical dynamite, family. Y'all need to be at that Kickstarter now supporting this film. This is for your children. This film right here is a film that all your children need to watch. So when they go to school, they will have the psychological ammunition needed for one of these kids who come to them. Just think about the kid of this guy who called up. See, you got to have your children with psychological and intellectual ammunition. So when one of these deceptive ass suspected white supremacists come around your kids lying, 
they'll know how to check that. Y'all need to be hitting that Kickstarter on my profile now. Let me get my brother Black Alpha Network here. What's up, Black Alpha Network? Where you at, brother? I'm good, sir. How are you? Doing good, doing good. I just want to make two points and I'll go ahead and land. And I want the yes, FBA sir. to realize the reason why these tether class, the reason why they're so upset is because the dominant society has spent so much time trying to elevate them above us and keep us as, a, yes. you know, to keep us as a permanent upper uh, underclass. And if we get reparations, all that upper class and elevation they give them is going down the drain, down the drain, yes. you know, because they know we, we yes. get things popping when we get our stuff together. We're not like them getting dominated and fleeing. And then two, uh, I want to make a point. I heard you speaking about this the other day is how these other groups around here, they try to focus more on not what you are about what you call yourself, where, you yeah. know, us FBAs and lineage basis, clear as day, foundational means you are the foundation of this country, which means your people can be traced back to slavery. Not you're an Indian or you're a, a tether group there and another tether group there. You're a foundational black American and it's about what you are and not what you want to be. So that's all I want to say, brother, and salute to you. And I just got your book, brother, and it's popping. So I appreciate it. Man, much respect to you, brother. I appreciate you. But yeah, that's real talk. See, that's why certain folks, my brother Black Alpha brought up a good point. A lot of folks, the 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 term foundational Black American, they, they're frustrated with that because they can't remix it. That one stopped them right there. See, they can remix a lot of other terms. Like African-American, they can remix that. Somebody who can come over here, and they do that all the time. They, You got a person who comes over here, and they're from Africa. Like, I'm African-American. I'm just like these niggas. You know, they can get whatever everybody else get. Hell, white people can say African-American. Charlize Theron and all these, they can say African-American. Elon Musk, remember, they were trolling, running around talking about he's one of the richest African-Americans. Because technically, he is an African-American. They can remix that. See, they can remix all these other terms. But when you say foundational Black American, that one they can't remix. Even descendants of slaves, they can kind of remix that. Well, I'm from Cuba, and we had slaves there, so I'm a descendant of slaves. And Cuba's in the Americas, so I'm a descendant of slaves from the Americas. Yeah, they can kind of remix that too. But no, they can't. But when you say foundational black American, I'm a black American. Are you foundational, though? Did your family build this country? No, you ain't us. See, that's a hell of a claim that nobody else has, family. Once we understand who we are, see, that that stops people in their tracks. So Y'all didn't build this bitch from scratch. We are the only non-immigrant group. We are not immigrants. And nobody can remix that. Well, we all came from Africa, nigga. No, no, no. Yeah, we all did, but we all didn't build this damn country. Yeah, everybody came from Africa, but everybody didn't build the United States from scratch. That makes us unique and it makes us different. And we are not the same when it comes to getting a lineage claim. We have a claim to this land that other people don't have. We have to stop letting these people make us into, make us feel like we're foreigners on our ancestral land. Watch out for them in Cobra Sambos who keep trying to Africanize us and run around talking about how we need to go back to the motherland. No, the countries that were in Africa when we left hundreds of years ago, those countries and boundaries don't even exist no more. Let's stop people trying to run this game on us. This is our spot. Our family built this spot from scratch. And they stayed here and sacrificed so that we can get some out the game. And we're going to honor our foundational Black American ancestors. We're going to honor them and respect them. I can't wait till y'all see this movie, American Maroon. This is going to be a must see for every black family. And we made this clean. Our, my last movie, Buck Breaking, I, I would warn people that wasn't a movie for children. It was a lot of explicit stuff in there. It was a blockbuster movie. That movie was huge. 
that movie took off majorly, but it wasn't for children. This movie, children can watch this. There's some violence in it. There's some violence, because we, we do kill a lot of white supremacists in the movie. If you look at the trailer, people are like, damn. And let me, that's another thing, too. Let, let, me, let me be clear, because the trailer, we killed a couple of white supremacists in the trailer, characters, some of the characters. And you know, truth be told, I think the trailer scared some Negroes. I've, I've had some Negroes hit me up. Man, oh no, this movie right here, then. I don't know, them folks gonna be mad. They're gonna be coming at you now. They, they, they're gonna be mad. Y'all killing them white folks like that. Is, uh, oh no. I like your movies, but this right here, it might be a little over the top. I, 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 I can hear, I'm, I'm reading them type this and I can hear the eyes bucking. And if you haven't seen the trailer, this is based on something that happened down in Suwannee, down in Florida, where the, the Maroons ambushed um, um, Andrew Jackson and his troops. And, you know, they, they gave him that work. Some black folks, they don't mind us talking about history. But when you see our history, when we're talking about we're, we're fighting for ourselves and we're bringing it to them white supremacist asses, Subconsciously, sometimes that scares a lot of black folks because when we talk about maroon societies, these were self-contained societies. They didn't depend on white people. A lot of black people will talk about racism so they can just get along with white folks. That's why they don't mind talking about Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman actually was working with the union. She was working with white churches, so she was working with white abolitionists. So black folks are kind of comfortable with talking about Harriet Tubman because white people are comfortable talking about Harriet Tubman. You, you, you see what I'm saying? But this thing about the Maroons and a lot of black folks, you know, white folks don't like talking about the Maroons, but then there's a lot of black folks who don't like talking about them either because white folks are uncomfortable with it. Anything white people are uncomfortable with, a lot of older black folks get uncomfortable with it. And white folks don't like talking about the Maroons because the Maroons didn't need their asses. The Maroons were a self-contained unit. These were black folks who were setting up societies in swamps around the Southeast and the South, and they were deliberately staying away from white people. They didn't need white people at all. In fact, they were bringing it to white people's asses. That type of mentality, that scares a lot of black folks, even to this day. Because a lot of black folks, man, let's, let's, can we keep it a buck? Can we keep it a buck? Can we keep it a buck? A lot of black folks don't really want real independence. You know why? And I'm not saying all, but I'm just saying a lot, a lot of black folks don't want no real independence. They just kind of want to get along with white folks so the white folks won't be so mean to them. But a lot of folks don't want no real independence. Why? Because you got to be responsible. You got to be 24-7 responsible when you're really independent. So half the stuff that we've allowed to seep into our culture, that will go by the wayside immediately if we are going to have real Black independence. Do y'all feel what I'm saying? Some of the goofball stuff that we let happen and become a part of so-called Black culture, if we're going to get real independence, all of that's going to have to go. All of the dustiness, all of the dudes knocking up chicks and not taking care of your kids, that has to that's that would go by the wayside because there would be nobody subsidizing that situation. Nobody's going to subsidize dustiness if we're really black and independent. If we have a black for real independent society, there would be no place for that. Nobody's going to subsidize that. White people subsidize it because they understand a broken family is good fodder for the prison system. That's why they subsidize dusty niggatry. Nobody's going to subsidize hood rat twerking all damn day in a black independent society because it's useless. That's some leftover nonsense from the plantations. You understand? Nobody's going to subsidize cats sitting around getting high and drunk all damn day. Nobody in a black independent society is going to subsidize that. Again, real black independence means everybody's going to have to be on their square. Everybody's going to have to be on their P's and Q's because we're going to run a real society. Who's going to run the water supply systems? Who's going to run the electrical power grids? 
who's going to run the outer space satellites, who's going to do the land development, who are going to be the contractors. We can't have contractors with purple weed lips and baby mama problems. You understand what I'm saying? You can't run a functional society with dusty goofball mindsets. We're not going to have nuclear physicists with pink lace fronts. You're not going to have neurosurgeons, dudes walking around here in booty shorts and flip flops and tattoos of genuine on their stomach or whatever these moist niggas do. You, you see, the stuff we see now, a lot of the dysfunction, those are the creations that white supremacists created. If you go through some of the hood areas now, it is a mess what you see. That's all created by the white supremacists. Dusty niggas, hood rats, moist niggas. Running around here confused, um, don't know what to do, high. That's a creation of white supremacist society. When you have a black independent society, all of that stuff is gonna be completely useless. I think black folks have gotten so comfortable with that dustiness. When we start talking about building an independent black society and not having the dominant society in our business, that scares niggas, because like, what? Well, I like your stuff, but I don't know. I can't get high no more? What? I got to get out here and build something with y'all? But I wake up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Damn, I, what time I got to get up? I turn up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I got to get up at 8 and work and, and build? You see what I'm saying? The whole There's a lot of mindsets that have to be changed. Now, let, let's be clear. There's some... There's some of us out there that's with the business. That's that's all about that life. Right now, there's some of us that's about that. But we have to be real. There's a lot of us who, who's not about that. And let's not even count the fleeing tethers. Let's not even count them who then fled from where they came from. And they come over here and just understand what their mindset is going to be if white folks ain't running nothing. If white folks ain't running nothing, what do you think these tethers are going to do? These tethers will be the first ones trying to slit our throats. What did you niggas do with the white people? I came here to be with the white people. You niggas. Get... No, no. Give me a knife. Them tethers be slight, slitting our throats if they can, because I'll slap the shit out of about three, four of them down. I can get four or five of them by myself. I can get tens of millions by myself. But I'm going to need help with a couple of them Ugandans. But I can take tens of millions. <laughs> Shout out to the Somalians in here. <laughs> but yeah, we better understand what's going on out here, man. We better be on top of our game and we better be all about building something. Let me get some more of the family on here. We got to stop being scared to build. All right, let me see who we got in here. Uh, a lot of folks. How many people we got in here? Y'all in here deep. It's um, 1130 and it's a lot of y'all in here. Let's get um sick of it. Let's get brother sick of it. He's sick of it. Tell me how sick of it you are, brother. Sick of it? All right, sick of it. All right, we're waiting on him to turn his microphone on. And while we're waiting on sick of it, we'll get Colin somebody. What's this person's name? Colin something. All right, let's get um, um, Torthel Robinson. All right, Torthel Robinson. Let's get him in here. All right, Torthel. Yes. What's up, brother? Hey, how you doing, man? I'm good. What's on your mind? Um, well, I like everything that that you stand for. I like the name. I'm, you know. Chiming in with the uh, foundation, foundational um, black Americans. Um, okay, it's, it's all right. It's taking this brother too long to kind of get to the point. Listen, 
I want y'all to be focused. I had to get him off. I don't know this brother. Um, y'all got to get to the point. It's taking too long for my man to get to the point. I don't want y'all to call up trying to figure out your thoughts. I do not want that. All right. I want y'all to kind of get to the point here. Y'all got to be focused. All right. Raise your hand if you want to get on here. Let's get a couple of people on. I'm not going to be on too, too long. Who's ready? Whose microphone is ready right now? Raise your hand and let me get you on here. Let's get Agent Orange. Let's get Agent Orange. <clears throat> Agent Orange, hop on, brother. Cheddar. Hello. What's up, Cheddar? Yo, 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 what's good, Tariq? Um, man, I, it's an honor to speak to you, bro. Um, I really ain't got no trolling for you, nothing. I'm just happy to talk to you, man. I listened to you for about 10 years, and uh, I really walk with your shit, so. Man, much respect to you, brother. Thank you so much. Shout out to How long, what, do we have any Mac Lessons, former Mac Lessons listeners in here? I was thinking about that the other day. Um, I've been doing podcasting for a long time. Do y'all know, let me give y'all some trivia. Not to toot my own horn. Do y'all know I was one of the first people to really do a poppin' podcast? I don't say that to brag. A lot of folks don't know that. I've been in the podcast game real early, really back. Podcasting really just got poppin', poppin' fairly recently. I started podcasting in um, 2006. That's almost 20 years ago. That's almost 20 years ago. I started podcasting in 2006. 2006, there were not a lot of podcasts. Podcasts were very rare because you didn't have too many mediums for them. At the time, MySpace was popping. I started doing my podcast and um, YouTube just got started and at the time you couldn't you couldn't put podcast on YouTube because YouTube a lot of folks don't remember YouTube you can only put like 10 to 15 minutes worth of material on YouTube YouTube was very limited to how much um, data how many how much video you can put on you can only put a 15 minute video on YouTube at the time so YouTube wasn't even popping like that. It just got started, but it wasn't really popping yet. And I was doing the Mac Lessons podcast and I kept switching different forums to do it because we kept bringing in such a big audience. A lot of the the forums and the 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 pages that were offering podcasting, they couldn't host that type of audience. It, it was... A lot of these pages were crashing at the time. There were no mediums to host like an hour long podcast of audio like that. So we had to build our own website. We had to build the Mac Lessons Radio website and we figured out a way to um, not have crazy bandwidth and all that stuff. So we got it popping. But yeah, we were doing this stuff early on. We were doing that for a long time. A lot of folks don't know that um, to be in a game like that in the podcasting game for damn near 20 years, and your shit is still popping like that, that's something that, you know, that it, it shows that you gotta, you gotta have something that the people wanna hear. You gotta be interesting. And you gotta be 100. You don't, you don't keep an audience that long by not keeping it 100. When you keep it 100, people will rock with you. That's all we've always done. I used to be real raw than this back in the day, by the way. Some of y'all don't know. This, what y'all see now is real tame. Y'all know back in the day, the Mac lessons was raw. We were raw. The phone calls were raw. I used to go off on folks, dude. Back in the day, some of y'all remember some of the classics. I'm going to have to do a whole expose about some of the classic Mac lessons. We used to go off on folks, dude. So, yeah, the, those were the days. But then, you know, oh, Lord, T.S. Giselle. Should I let T.S. Giselle up? I try to give everybody a voice, but oh, Lord. <clears throat> All right, let me get T.S. Giselle on here. Okay, let me get... Uh, good evening, T.S. Giselle. How are you? 
Hello, TS. Hold on, my sound. Hold on. No. Okay, are you making a delivery right now, TS? Hold on. Okay, TS is making a delivery okay. through Bussy Eats right now. Okay, well. He's delivering a book eat order. So Go look. I wasn't. I'm gonna, I'll get you on. Like, I wasn't uh, going to come on. Well, okay. Well, you're ready. I wasn't going to come on tonight. Okay. But it's a little boring tonight, and there's only a thousand people here. So you know, I'm that girl, and so I usually will only come on when you have more guests speaking because I'm always advertising. Um, but it was a little dry tonight, Tariq. So I needed to come and save the space. Well, okay. Who else got a thousand? Wait. wait. Who else has a thousand people? At damn near at midnight on a Friday. Who else? Who else on here? This is the only popping Twitter I mean, space, and you know it, TS. For me, I just demand a little more attention. But when you started talking about Raw, I was like, okay, that's my. Let me get on and see what's the tea. <laughs> okay. And Tariq, Lord. I saw your little shout out on Twitter. It wasn't cute. Which one? I what? 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 Which one are you talking um, about? I saw the. Legs and hips and body, my anthem. I, okay, I didn't you say didn't your say name. My name but I, I didn't say you're talking about because I'm that girl. I, that's a hit and dog hollering. That's and a hit dog. For all of the comments, and I wish they would learn how to spell my name. But of I, course, I didn't even say your name. I, I didn't say your name. See, that's it. Let me put it up in the jumbo <laughs> tron for those who don't know. Hold on. Now, I. This is a hit dog hollering. Y'all look in the jumbotron, right? I didn't say TS's name. Y'all click that. I, I said when certain people hop into everybody's Twitter space to troll, and I, I never mention your name, hit dogs but be hollering. I have see? A, you know, a business proposition for you. Um, if you look at your comments oh. on YouTube, um, your fans are really starting to like the conversations that we have. Um, so maybe we should do a space once a week, you know, a lot of your fans are starting to be convinced by me. Let me make it very clear. No, let me make it very clear. No, I am 100% black American on both sides of my family. I'm pro reparation. I don't believe you. I'm yeah. pro reparation. No, you're not. Now, I am not a fan of Marcel and I do not affiliate with FDA, but I'm still black American. Um, well, you, you can't say you don't affiliate with FBA and be an FBA. You're not a foundational Black American and say you don't affiliate with foundational there Black There are Americans. reasons as to That'll why make... I don't affiliate with FBA. Because you're not. You come from a. You must come from an immigrant I do background. I come from an immigrant background. I've already told you a thousand times. I am from North Carolina. But I don't. My family, all four of my grandparents, were born in South Carolina. And if you know Black American history, it does not get more Black American or foundational Black American than South Carolina does. But I don't but, believe. <laughs> I don't believe you. That's why you don't like using the term foundational Black American because I, I think you come from somewhere. Aren't else. you from the North? Um, you don't get more Black and American than the South, especially the Carolinas. No, my family is from the South. I was born in Detroit, but my family is from the South. From in the South. There's no immigrants. All my family are foundational so Black Americans. Gonna Everybody. Gonna I, you, Tariq, where's your family from? Alabama and North Carolina. Oh, so All my cousins. <laughs> oh, God. Lord, no. So, but if we are, don't come to the family reunion. Um, yeah. But anywho, but anyway, thank I you so much, it. Tijo. Thank you so much. It, it, okay, go back making a dick dash order or whatever you're doing. Lord. Okay. Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> Let's see who else is on here. We got a lot of folks in here. Oh, Lord. And what the hell do TSGL be out this late at night for? What you out this late at night for, dude? This, this motherfucker be out doing all types of strange stuff in the middle of the night. Because you down in Atlanta, I think. And it's like, ain't it like, like three in the morning out there? Okay. Oh, yeah, what are you doing out there, T.S. Giselle? It's three in the morning where you are. What the hell are you doing out? <laughs> I just thought about that. I forgot. It's like, ain't it like three o'clock on the East Coast right now? And ain't nothing open down in Atlanta at three o'clock except Bussy. That's the only thing that's open. Oh, Lord. Okay. 
Anyway, let me get some more folks on here. Let me get some women. Oh, we got any women in here? We need to get the, the energy right now. We need to we need to fix the energy. All right. I see you, Linus. A lot of a lot of y'all cute women's up in here. What y'all cute women doing up this late? I see y'all. A lot of cute women in the chat room. Not that I'm looking at y'all like that. I'm just acknowledging that there's a lot of cute women in the chat room. I don't want to be like Papa. Did y'all see? <laughs> I don't want to be like the Prince of Pancakes. Did y'all see Papa hollering at the snow bunny at the mall? Did y'all see that video? <laughs> Did y'all see the Prince of Parmesan cheese hollering at the white girl at the mall family? That was hilarious. And then he tried to explain. I'm not trying to beat up on him. What, what happened? I broke my phone. And I went to the mall. And I had to get my phone fixed. <laughs> he tried to explain. He's up here spitting at a Becky. All right, Papa. All right, dude. I'm not going to beat up on the guy. I'm not going to beat up on him. But he's a descendant of Tiger Woods. He's hollering at the Beckys and reprimanding people about hollering at Beckys. All right, dude. Anyway, y'all, let me get up out of here, man. Listen. Much respect to the family, man. I thank everybody for tuning in. Everybody, click the profile. Click my profile, ladies and gentlemen, where you can go and check out the movie and check out the trailer. If you've not seen the trailer for my new film, American Maroon, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Y'all see up in the Jumbotron? I want y'all to click that link in the Jumbotron, ladies and gentlemen. Watch the trailer for my new movie. Support the Kickstarter get involved. We got a lot of great perks and rewards for everybody who's getting involved. Much respect, man. We appreciate you. Let's make this thing happen, family. Man, y'all have a great night. Y'all have a great